We are here. I'm here to help host uh, lecture number 28 with Professor Rama uh, Vasudeva. And I would just like to mention that uh, she has some particularly impressive relation, uh, work that she has done with political economy. Uh, and that includes the editing of the, uh, that includes her work having been published in the Cambridge Journal of Economics, um, Economic and Political Weekly, Journal of, Economics, of Economic Issues, Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics, Macroeconomica, Monthly Review, Review of Keynesian Economics, Review of Political Economy, Review of Radical Political Economics, and Structural Change in Economic Dynamics. And in particular, I'd like to just uh, mention that Rama is a member of the steering committee of the Union of Radical Political Economists, uh, URPE, which will be holding a conference to celebrate its 50th anniversary in September at University of Massachusetts Amherst. With that, I will turn the floor over to Professor Vasu Devin. Can you hear me? No. More important, can you see me? Yeah? Yeah. Better. Okay. So it has been a privilege to be part of this conference, and I'm really honored to be invited to give the Henry Lefebvre Lecture. Thank you to all the organizers. It has been a really stimulating few days, and particularly because, I mean, I've been in the silo of Marx the Economist, and more specifically, Volume 3, Capital, for really, really long, and it's been great to get out of my silo and be, to be exposed to all these other dimensions, and in particular, to another Marx. So thank you so much to the organizers, participants, and everyone who made this possible. So my talk today focuses on the relevance of Marx's theory of money to the contemporary world. And there is a connection that can be made to Lefebvre. In the critique of everyday life, he writes, although deprivation and alienation are different for the proletarian and the non-proletarian, one thing unites them, money, the human being's alienated essence. This alienation is constant, that is practical and everyday. He also writes, money, currency, commodities, capital are nothing more than relations between human beings. On a macro level, such relations are mediated, they pass via the thing, reified and reifying, alienating and alienated, commodities, money, language. So this connection between money relations and alienation can be traced back to Marx. Now, Marx's theory of money was integral to his analysis of capitalist dynamics. But this rich potential of Marx's theory of money has unfortunately not received the attention which I think it deserves, both by political economists and those who have been inspired by Marx's political vision. Um, so one reason for this neglect is, of course, that Marx has for a long time, famously by Schumpeter, been regarded as a theoretical metallist. He put forward a general theory of money and traced the emergence of money as a general equivalent in the context of the simplest relations of commodity exchange where a specific commodity like gold served as money. So his monetary analysis is seen as largely irrelevant to today's world where money is linked to the liability of a state. But it's quite clear from Marx's writings that his abstract theory of money as a general equivalent was only the starting point of his concrete monetary and financial analysis. Now, the second reason is that Marx never fully fleshed out his analysis of the credit system. His writings in volume three were, according to Engels, a disordered jumble of notes, comments, and extract materials that in no way constituted a finished draft or even an outline plan. But they were at the beginning of an elaboration and contain a wealth of insights. The full development of the consequences of his theory uh, for the complex monetary and financial phenomena of today is a challenge that Marxist political economists need to address. So I'm going to begin by highlighting some aspects of the analytical approach Marx uh, uh, deployed in theorizing money. Then I'll turn to the concrete analysis of financial markets in the 19th century as a prelude to comprehending contemporary international monetary system. The idea being is to trace his analysis of credit money 
elaborated to understand a credit money standard, both domestically and internationally. Okay, so Marx's fundamental insight is that money expresses and establishes social relations. From this insight, he develops his conception of credit as a means of acquiring absolute command over property and capital. So it's sometimes said that Marx regarded money as a veil, uh, for instance, income. Now this is true only in the sense that money obfuscates and mystifies the underlying social relations. It does not mean, as it did for the classical economists, that he regarded money as neutral. He first demonstrates that com commodity relations are inherently monetary in character, and then he erects his conception of capitalist social relations as an intrinsically financial system. So Marx develops the, his analysis of the different functions of money and for its forms of money in the context of the circulation of commodities and commodity money. And he does this before he discusses the role of money in financing capital production and accumulation. So he does this through a sequenced order of steps, which reflects his understanding of the fundamentally complementary and contradictory nature of these different functions as a unit of account, as a, uh, as a measure, as a medium of circulation, and as a means of payment. So he sets up this really simple thought experiment to show how a product becomes a commodity. The commodity becomes exchange value. The exchange value of the commodity appears as its imminent money property to achieve a separate existence in the form of money. And this thought experiment allows him to uncover the contradictions inherent in the money relation. Contradictions which are wrapped up in the separate existence of money alongside commodities. So Marx writes, it is an inherent property of money to fulfill its purposes by simultaneously negating them to achieve independence from commodities, to be a means which becomes an end, to realize exchange value of commodities by separating them from it, to facilitate exchange by splitting it, to overcome the difficulties of direct exchange of commodities by generalizing them, to make exchange independent of the producers in the same measure as producers become dependent on exchange. So the money form arises in the first instance from the contradiction between the dual existence of commodities as use value and exchange value. This contradiction is developed and displaced once the act of exchange is split into two mutually independent acts of sale and purchase. This separation between sale and purchase contains the latent possibility of crisis. And so the contradictory unity of use value and exchange value is reproduced in uh, that between flows of money and commodities. So Marx traces the possibility of a divergence between the structure of demand and the concrete use values produced in the course of these flows. And his analysis of how demand shortfalls can arise anticipates Keynes' postulation of the principle of effective demand. But Marx also points to two further levels of contradictions the, in the Grundrisse. The first arises when the overall movement of exchange itself becomes separate from the exchangers. The sphere of commerce, concerned solely with exchange for the sake of exchange and not for consumption, interposes itself between the circulation of commodities produced under various social conditions. This becomes the basis of the emergence of merchant capital, the oldest historical mode in which capital has an independent existence. Production for exchange and consumption is subsumed to the imperatives of commerce, buying cheap in order to sell dear, with the specific aim of accumulating money, not commodities. Finally, the contradictions of the money form, which continue to unfold in the operations of the sphere of credit and finance, which separates from the sphere of commerce. So the contradictions now appear as a disjunction between the money's role as a universal equivalent and also as a particular commodity, which is subject to particular conditions of exchange in its exchange with all other commodities. These conditions can contradict its general unconditional exchangeability. So if posed in terms of commodity money standard or gold standard, this points to the contradiction between the value of money expressed as an expression of exchange value of all commodities and its particular value as a produced commodity, gold or whatever. So these passages in Grundrisse contain the core of Marx's argument of how the contradictions of money form are displaced as money evolves with the development of capitalism to become both a general equivalent and also a financial asset. 
In fact, this formulation of the development and displacement of the contradictions of the money form in Grundrisse provide a kind of a roadmap to integrating the concrete discussion of credit and finance in Capital Volume 3 with the abstract theory of Capital Volume 1. And I want to uh, uh, kind of highlight how these passages also allow the extrapolation of his, the logical structure of his argument to investigating contemporary money systems which are based on a state credit system, by which I mean a system where the monetary liability of a state functions as money, not just domestically, but in the context of the dollar internationally. So the critical link in the evolution of the state credit standard is money in its role as a means of payment. Um, and as, this basically means money becomes a tradable promise to pay. So money invest, uh, Marx investigated how money's function as a means of payment springs directly out of its role in commerce. And while credit money plays a limited role when capitalism is not yet developed, the credit economy develops on the basis of the monetary economy with the growth and spread of capitalism and eventually comes to dominate and replace it. So he constructs a theory of credit as a secondary concrete layer of his analysis, but it plays a really integral role in his analysis of capitalist dynamics and it reflects the full fruition of the money form in capitalism. And his argument clarifies the monetary roots of the credit system. So he draws this uh, uh, analogy between the relationship of the monetary system to the credit system, comparing it to that between Catholicism and Protestantism. He says, the monetary system is essentially a Catholic institution. The cre credit system is essentially Protestant. But the credit system does not emancipate itself from the basis of the monetary system any more than Protestantism has emancipated itself from the foundations of Catholicism. So the forms of credit money in the early 19th century, which included bills of exchange, which are basically IOUs and bank, depos bank deposits, which are basically the liability of a bank, this was the 19th century. And the credit system now has become considerably more complex, and the forms of credit money have also evolved to include things like repos, which I'll talk about in a bit, and um, what's been called shadow money today. So bills of exchange were promises to pay backed by private guarantees of financial institutions. Repos are promises to pay backed by tradable collateral. You basically sell an uh, a asset with a promise to buy it back at a certain date, at a certain price. So credit money is a logical and historical link between the monetary system and the financial system, and I will argue is also key to the development of an evolution of world money. So the forms of credit money which emerged in the financing of trade through the 19th century, they were the foundation of the capitalist foundation, uh, financial system. The growing dominance of credit money in the financial system is fundamentally an expression of the separation of finance and money dealing from commerce that Marx alluded to in the passages from Grundrisse I referred to uh, a moment ago. So it reflects the potential contradiction between money's value as a general equivalent and its particular valuation as an asset. In concrete practice, this contradiction between these values is expressed and resolved in the workings of the money market, where credit money and short-term paper are traded. In the early half of the 19th century, credit money in the form of bills of exchange played an important role in mediating inland trade in England. But by the latter half of the 19th uh, century, the sterling bill was a dominant instrument mediating international trade, and the bill market had matured into this buoyant, well-developed money market centered around the city of London. So prolifer proliferating bill trade created private monetary mechanisms at a time when note issued by the Bank of England was still tied to gold reserves. And these mechanisms are crucial to fostering liquidity, independent of these gold reserves. Marx had stressed that the mediation of this chain of payments by forms of credit money, like bills of exchange, does not do away with the need for cash payments, in an absolute sense. Uh, in the historical context of the mid-19th century, when he was writing, the credit money mechanisms of the bill market were, in the final analysis, anchored to Bank of England notes. And the Bank of England notes were tied to gold reserves in the Bank of England vaults. So the monetary system then and now was, structured, was constituted by a structured hierarchy of claims and liabilities. And at each level of this hierarchy, there's a higher form of money 
as a means of payment that can extinguish debts lower down in that hierarchy. So bills of exchange had to be settled in terms of Bank of England notes. Bank of England notes were ultimately settled through the payment of gold. There's thus, as Marx delineated, a contradiction inherent in this credit money system. As long as payments balance, uh, it's merely functioning as a nominal form of a unit of account. But when payments don't balance and actual payments have to be made, money is not needed in this nominal form, but as money proper, something solid, the universal commodity. And this precipitates monetary crisis. Such monetary crises occur, Marx writes, where the ever-lengthening chain of payments and an artificial system of settling them has been fully developed. As the heart pants after fresh water, so pants his soul after money, the only wealth. In a crisis, the antithesis between commodities and their value form is raised to the level of an absolute contradiction. So developed capitalist countries replace money by credit operations or credit money, but in times of pressure, credit dries up and money confronts all other commodities as the only means of payment, the true embodiment of value. So at precisely the time when there's this violent scramble for means of payments, it actually becomes harder to convert these means of payment or credit money into hard cash. So again, in the context of the bill market of the 19th century, uh, that Marx is writing about, the crisis appears in the form of a demand for Bank of England notes, which is itself a form of credit money tied to gold reserves. So the Bank of England came to play a critical role in restoring liqu liquidity and re-establishing the terms of convertibility. Crisis occurred, for instance, in 1847 and 1857, and the Bank of England was compelled to periodically intervene to prop up the banking system. And Marx poured through the reports of the committees to, into these um, uh, episodes. And he characterized the Bank of England as the biggest capital power in London and the center of gravity of all commercial credit. But even so, he argued, its power is not absolute. Uh, it had to develop the tools and mechanisms for enforcing its will over the private channels of liquidity creation in these periods of normalcy. When the market was dominated by private financial institutions, the large discount houses and joint stock banks. In particular, the Bank of England was constrained by the gold reserves in its walls, and gold was needed to secure convertibility. But gold had another critical function in the spirit. In the context of the international gold standard, it functioned as world money. It was needed for the settlement of international payments. So the breakdown of convertibility during these crises of 1847 and 1857 was further compounded by the outflow of gold. And these breakdowns in convertibility, Marx argued, had far-reaching implications for the reproduction of existing social relations. And it was this threat to underlying social relations that dictated the imperative need for the central bank to intervene and ensure that the conditions for convertibility were maintained and to protect the value of money. We see the same compulsions operating today in the bailouts to the banks after the financial crisis following the collapse of Lehman Brothers. At the heart of this collapse was the implosion of what's been called the shadow banking system, unregulated financial mechanisms of funding the capital market through the contemporary equivalent of the bills of exchange, the repo, which I mentioned earlier. So the consequences of this breakdown of these mechanisms of liquidity and credit creation, which you could call a run on the repo, compelled massive interventions by the US Federal Reserve. But I want to highlight another aspect of Marx's discussion of monetary crisis and the drain of gold, which is his analysis of the contagion-like spread of balance of payment crisis from one country to another in succession, like Wally firing. So a balance of payment crisis may begin in one country, a creditor country like England, but the drain of gold induced by this crisis, the ensuing bankruptcy of importers, leads to distressed sales of both goods and securities and transmits the crisis to its trading partners. Now, Marx recognized much before Keynes the inherent deflationary bias of the gold standard system. The Bank of England dealt with the crisis of uh, 1846 and 57 and 66 by abandoning convertibility of, of sterling bills to gold. But by the end of the century, for instance, the Bearings Crisis of 1890, the bank was able to weather monetary and financial crisis without revoking its commitment to convertibility. It did so by borrowing from countries like France and special depositors like India and Japan. This was a development that Marx did not explicitly address or anticipate. 
Significantly, his discussion of the debt deflationary spiral places its effects within the developed commercial world. I mean, Marx did recognize how England deployed its role in mediating triangular patterns of trade to contain the impact of a drain of gold reserves. So India's exports to North America and Australia were covered by drafts on England. The East India Company's drafts and later that of the British Indian government were in fact Marx quipped, brought into being by an import from India for which England does not pay an equivalent. It boiled down to a tribute exacted from India. The historical evolution of the gold standard after Marx's death suggests it is countries like India and Japan which provided a critical source of short-term credit when other advanced capitalist countries like France proved less willing to lend to the Bank of England. The financial system centered around the city of London recycled these surpluses in the and then re-exported them to primary commodity exporters in Latin America and Australia. And these uh, primary, I mean, these, these primary, uh, these countries, Latin America, Australia, bore the brunt of convertibility crisis and destabilizing capital flows. So in 1890s, when the Bearings Bank in the city of London was on the brink of bankruptcy due to the failure of its investments in Argentina, the Bank of England, the Treasury, and a group of financiers, including Rothschild, got together a guarantee to fund, a guarantee fund to bail out the Bearings Bank while imposing reforms and austerity measures on the Argentinian government to ensure debt was repaid. Sounds familiar. It's, this experience is not unlike the structural adjustment packages and the accompanying austerity measures which are imposed on developing countries which faced balance of payment crisis through the interventions of the IMF uh, in the 80s and 90s. So Marx recognized the elasticity that credit money provided to the monetary system. However, he did argue that in times of crisis, the limited stock of gold reserves of the Bank of England constrained its capacity to intervene in the, bank bill, in the bill market. But the parallel monetary mechanisms of this international bill market, the asymmetric integration of less advanced countries, Britain's colonial power, all of these in effect imparted a greater degree of elasticity and left added heft to the Bank of England's capacity uh, to intervene in the financial markets. The Bank of England was in the last uh, decades of the 19th century able to exercise much greater control over the money market and maintain convertibility through its interventions in the money market on the basis of its position at the center of the international financial system despite its relatively small stock of gold reserves. In the process, the Bank of England also took on the mantle of the lender of last resort for the financial system, not just domestically, but internationally. This is the reason for the smooth functioning of the international gold standard, and this evolution of central bank functions has been pivotal to the resilience of the financial dis system despite its propensity to crisis. The international gold standard was in effect a British pound sterling standard with the bill on London, a form of credit money being used increasingly to finance trade and international transactions. Uh, the concrete history of Bank of England intervention since the 1890s also reveals how the contemporary sta state credit standard evolved out of the state and central bank's attempts to manage and regulate these private money markets. Um, increased treasury operations of the period helped bolster the bank's control over the bill market. But at the end, I mean, in this period, the treasury bill was introduced. And it, uh, with the introduction of the treasury bill, uh, short-term claims on the state. So the private bill was a claim on financial institutions or whoever was a drawer of the bill. But these treasury bills was a claim on the state. And so you have short-term claims on the state which came coming to play a greater role in the British money market. And this happens at precisely the time when the foreign bills of exchange or the sterling bill was declining in importance. In the process, gold was over time replaced by the monetary liability of Britain at the top of the monetary hierarchy and the money market became linked much more closely to the management of public debt. The issue of public debt becomes central. And the issue of public debt also generates a parallel sphere of financial transactions which foster the growth of financial dealers and speculators. The liabilities of the state function in the hands of creditors, those who buy these, these bills and bonds, 
as a liquid asset that can be sold and resold multiple times, engendering the further growth of the financial system. And also the growth of a class of state creditors with a preferential claim to certain sums from the proceeds of taxation. What the buyers of public debt lend is transformed into tradable assets, which can be sold and resold, and it represents the creation and transfer of wealth to those who hold the debt, thus fostering the growth of what Marx called stock exchange gambling and a modern bankocracy. Public debt, to quote Marx again, performs the service of capital fallen from heaven. It breeds speculation and the concentration of wealth, and this connection between public debt and the growth and centralization of wealth, in particular, I mean, all the financial assets which have been, which are, which are being created, and the development of the financial system. This underscored for Marx how public credit becomes the credo of capital, marking the capitalist era with its stamp. This is apparent in the confounding process through which the accumulation of debts appears as the accumulation of capital. To use Marx's evocative words, uh, as with the stroke of the enchanter's wands, it endows unproductive money with the power of creation and thus turns it into capital, without forcing it to expose itself to the troubles and risks inseparable from its employment in industry or even usury. And so it would appear a nation becomes richer more, the more deeply it is in debt. The growing international credit system and that public debt fostered also obfuscated the sources of primitive accumulation in different parts of the world. Marx ascribes to public debt and the fiscal system corresponding to it a significant role both in capitalizing wealth and in the expropriation of the masses as a lever of primitive accumulation. There is thus a deep nexus between public debt and private finance and this nexus has only become more entrenched through the 20th century. Public debt is both the anchor and the basis of expansion of the contemporary capitalist financial system. Uh, the growth of this financial system, Marx writes, develops the motive of capitalist production, enrichment by exploitation of others' labor, into the purest and most colossal system of gambling and swindling, and restricts even more the already small number of exploiters of social wealth. The structural implications of the rise to dominance of finance for growing inequality and concentration are, of course, of profound significance in the contemporary world. The implication of the state in the mechanisms of the financial market through monetary policy interventions and bank bailouts also highlights how the power of the state has become crucial to preserving this dominance and buttressing the resilience of the financial system. At the same time, this, the management of this growing scale of public debt is increasingly holding the state hostage to finance in what has been called the doom loop. What, what do I mean by that? The gambles of the financial system keep getting larger, threatening the functioning of the capitalist financial system. This necessitates larger and larger interventions by the state and central banks to restore the financial system, setting off a new round of debt, a new round of gamble, and even more bailouts. So the stranglehold of finance becomes increasingly more powerful. So the money market where short-term bills are traded is a critical terrain where the connection between the financial system and the state and state credit is established. The liquidity of the private sterling bill in the 19th century was derived from the implicit backstop that the Bank of England provided. However, with the introduction of the Treasury bill and increasing recourse to, to Treasury bills in the money market after 1890, the money market began to trade directly in short-term claims of the state. These claims came to be regarded as close substitutes to cash or gold precisely because they were promises to pay of the state. The tre this treasury bill then became a critical anchor of the money market in the 20th century and the credit system that had originated in private commercial transactions embedded in a system of private guarantees now discovered an instrument that was directly secured by the power and prestige of the state. This has profound implications for the resilience of the financial system and the evolving nexus of public debt and private finance. The evolution of the financial system in the advanced capitalist world after uh, the Great Depression and the Second World War ushered in a period where the state played an even larger role in regulating channels of private liquidity and the financial system. The scale and scope of state support to the banking system 
has been continuously ratcheting up. In the international terrain, however, world money remained tied to gold until the breakdown of the post-war Bretton Woods system in 1971, with the closing of the gold window. With the floating of the dollar in 73, the world money was finally unshackled completely from gold. The, the monetary liability of the dominant state, that of the US, became the basis for the international financial system and the modern international monetary system evolved to a state credit stand, standard hinged to the dollar. Now, money's role as world money arises with the development of world market and the extension of the international division of labor. The settlement of international payments with the transfer of world money is a means by which wealth is transferred from one nation to another and wealth is redistributed internationally. So, world as world money, money serves as the embodiment of social power internationally. Countries faced with a, with a balance of payment deficit draw down their reserves of world money and once that gets exhausted, they borrow in order to finance this deficit. The growing debt burden accentuates their subordinate international status and furthers the expropriation of their wealth. But with the emergence of the state credit standard, this, the deflationary adjustment mechanism which I alluded to gets affected and even the pattern by which wealth is transferred from deficit countries to surplus countries and the reordering of power internationally uh, as reserves are transferred, this also undergoes a change. With the international acceptance of uh, uh, the, the monetary liability of a state as world money, the state becomes a borrower of last resort, creating liquidity by acting like banks do when they borrow short and lend wrong. The ease of access to credit is key to the functioning of the state credit standard. It's the basis of the exorbitant privilege that the hegemonic country appropriates from the difference on the return on its monetary liability and the interest paid on foreign holdings of treasury bills and the returns on its accumulation of foreign assets, the income it receives. Um, and to wrap up, the, the evolution of the contemporary floating standard based on the US treasury bill thus implies the emergence of international monetary system based on the debt of the US state. The US a treasury bill is not simply the link between the U.S. state and private capital markets. As world money, the dollar is the link between the U.S. state and a hierarchy of other national states and private capital in the, in the international sphere. The end of the Bretton Woods arrangements that turned to neoliberalism ushered in a period where developing countries were increasingly integrated to the financial system. And neoliberalism was advocated as a tool to sustain the dollar's international role and ended up reinforcing dollar dominance. Uh, the rise to dominance of finance, along with the profusion of financial assets, has become integral to the workings of the floating dollar standard, and the privileged role the dollar provi has provides the US an extremely flexible credit line that allows it to run up deficits simply by issuing dollar debt. These mechanisms of dollar liquidity have also engendered the growing imbala uh, global imbalances, profound inequality, and the concentration of wealth, and have been fueling financial fragility. In fact, the crisis triggered in the wake of the collapse of Lehman Brothers reflects some of these tensions and vulnerabilities. While the crisis was in a very fundamental sense a crisis of dollar hegemony, the nexus between public debt and finance that lies at the core of the dominance of the dollar remains entrenched a decade after the crisis. The financial sector of the US has become even more concentrated. It has launched a concerted pushback against regulations Investment banking is witnessing a resurgence. The casino of finance is back in business. <laughs> the expanding balance sheets of central banks also reflect how deeply they're implicated in this process. While the history of the last century is testimony to the growing capacity of the state to act as lender of resort for, for the financial system and to ensure its resilience after each crisis, the growing scale of the casino and its consequences for growing inequality suggest that Marx's question about the limits to the power of state has resonance today. The evolution of world money based on the international state credit standard expanded the capacity of the state and central banks at the center of the international financial system to manage the system. This power, however, is not absolute. Thank you. Okay, we will now take a few questions.
All right. So can we have some questions, comments? Uh, I have two, three questions. First one is, uh, you had mentioned about the UK pound sterling gold standard. And uh, I don't know whether you mentioned colonialism. In case you did, it's okay. In case you don't, didn't, could you please clarify what role colonialism could have played in stabilizing that, number one. Number two, though you didn't say it, I suppose one can draw the inference that you actually feel that the current international monetary system is not tied to a commodity. I'm saying, uh, I suppose one can draw the inference that uh, you probably sa said or implied that uh, the international monetary system is not tied to a commodity. Actually, what is being traded is actually the liabilities of a government. The liabilities of a government, US government, okay. Oh, I want your reaction to the following argument that actually the stability or the viability of the US dollar is connected to its control of the oil trade. This is a hypothesis. I want your reaction to that. Thank you. And the hypothesis is that the viability of the US dollar is, co is connected to its control over the oil trade. Oil trade, oil trade, yeah, petroleum. Right here. Um, uh, first of all, that was a very, I think, insightful and pretty comprehensive uh, review of money in the modern world. Um, thank you for that. Uh, my question is uh, a little more broad and speculative in that um, I wonder what kind of system do you think we would need in order for money to actually uh, play a uh, more constructive role in the sense of um, dealing with uh, uh, some of the inequalities and some of the power relationships that exist among the players who uh, in fact control you know the monetary system as it exists today anyone else um, we have one here in the yeah. front Uh, in your discussion, I think you uh, discussed the money and the banking system as consisting the overall financial system. But I think if you see the recent uh, past, say last two, three decades, a number of financial institutions as well as financial instruments have come up which uh, plays probably a far more role than the money and the banking system. I think these financial systems and institutions have basically served the purpose of uh, <coughs> the huge mobility that financial system, financial surpluses enjoy across the world. It would not have been possible only with the banking system. Okay? And secondly, I also think, I'm not very sure, that these financial institutions and mechanisms play a, what you might be called a hedging role for the production system. If these institutions are not there, the production system would have been vulnerable to far more uh, ups and downs, which it would have been found difficult to adjust. I would like to, like to have your comment on that. Any others? Yeah, right here. Uh, I also want to thank you for a really wonderful lecture. Um, I'm wondering about the the history of a historian, uh, the, 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 the transition to um, state liability and also the role of socialism in that. Uh, in, I mean, of course in Britain, and, and Marx has a long section in volume three on Peel's Banking Act, and he has this wonderful discussion of the way that the, the role of the act is to be violated, that the purpose of the law is that it should be suspended. And so he's talking there about the crisis of the liberal state 
and the implication of the state in society. But when he looks at the French example and the Crédit Mobilier, uh, you know, there you have the saint Simonians directly involved uh, in trying to uh, transform the French state uh, financial system uh, under the empire. And so I'm wondering you know, where the 1840s, 50s, and 60s are in your analysis or where the kind of dividing line is uh, in this transition and what the mechanisms are and in particular what the um, threat of, of the rise of the socialist workers movement uh, plays in that. I mean it's a little bit clearer in the French case but how you think of the British case in that. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask, add a question to the group myself. Um, Okay, it's back. I wonder if you could just say a little more about what Marx has to say about the state and finance in general, whether what he says about uh, that dimension of the state, or is there very little actually said? Um, yeah, so I'll start with that. Unfortunately, it's very scattered and very little and very underdeveloped. So you have to kind of glean it from kind of uh, comments, notes scattered through. Mm -hmm. But he does say that, I mean, and doesn't build, he talks about that there is a link between the commercial and financial system and the, the, the evolution of state credit. But he never mm -hmm. actually kind of builds it. I mean, I mean at least in, so you, one has to actually that's the work we have to do. So, okay, so, so the um, colonialism. Yeah, I didn't mention it, but it's it's there, <laughs> very much part of the, uh, <clears throat> um, at least the early history of the a gold standard, where where colonial rule allowed Britain access to the surpluses of of India, which were made available to the Bank of England in London. So, so it's not just um, uh, home charges, but it's also all the surpluses. The gold, the excess gold was made available. And then also the way, I mean, without going into detail, the, the whole treatment of silver was all part of colonial policy to control gold reserves and have access to gold reserves. So it, it, it has a very important role, but it's, I mean, it doesn't have to be colony. Japan was not a colony and still Britain had its I mean, the uh, Japan surpluses were made available to the Bank of England, okay? On oil, um, I actually don't agree with that thesis uh, about it being linked to oil, either in terms of denomination of, uh, of oil or... Um, because for, for me, it's my, I mean, at least in the understanding I've reached, is that it's related to, again, this, abil this capacity to borrow the elasticity of uh, a state credit standard when the liability of the state is, uh, is the key, depends, it's like a bank. If, as long as you can borrow, you can lend. And uh, in, in boom times, you, you keep lending and then you borrow. In crisis time, there's a run. And you have to, I mean, your capacity to borrow is what's being kind of tested. And, England negotiated that through the second half of the 19th century, and the U.S. has been doing that. And my, my, my thesis in other work is that it does so by exporting crisis and fragility to debtor countries. So instead of the crisis hitting England or the U.S., the crisis hits Latin America in the 80s, Mexico and Asia in the 90s, and it's only in 2008, once developing countries have started holding reserves, that the crisis hits the U.S. in the periphery within U.S., the subprime market where the least creditworthy people borrow. Okay, um, so money. So, um, so the thing about money is it establishes and expresses social relations. So if you want to reform, you don't begin with money, you begin with the social relation. And 
the point you cannot understand cap i mean uh, uh, capitalism without money or finance i mean ca capitalism needs finance and there's a constructive role which finance plays it allows innovation expansion all of that i mean capitalism cannot survive without finance and that's why finance is this two edged sword on the one hand there's this dynamic potential it unleashes in in terms of uh, capitalism's um, dynamic potential but at the same time there is this other other role and and in particular as it grows it is both an instrument of increasing inequality and it's also uh, one way in which demand uh, is being fueled in the face of inequality just through issuing more more credit so it's 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 um it's it's a bit of a um i mean for the constructive role of money uh, i mean so so all the experiences of let's say nationalizing banks not just in developing countries but even in france they hit a limit at at a particular point of time so i've been um am i talking too long no i think you're okay yeah okay thank you <laughs> yeah so so uh, uh, think of china today china is experimenting in a very pragmatic manner with managing credit it is issuing um it's got, especially after the crisis it has been trying to gradually internationalize the renminbi while maintaining the reins on finance and it is like riding a tiger because uh, china has discovered that the more it opens up the more finance becomes ungovernable and so China has now put kind of tightened the reins but is still slowly is I mean, experimenting with ways of constructively managing finance let's see how it how far it succeeds the question about the hedging role and um so again as i said finance credit has a very important role integral role in in, cap, in the working of capitalism you cannot capitalism cannot function without that the problem is that while this role begins with financing capitalist accumulation i mean and that's the way you understand the role of finance it finances accumulation innovation all of that the problem with hedging is that hedging may have begun as a i mean um hedging for trade hedging for production things related to fundamental i mean to the real sector what what it evolves into is hedging as um as a speculative arbitrage uh kind of opportunity so the thing about um the current conjuncture is that finance is increasingly for finance so you are i mean so if the bill market which i was talking about began as fund for financing trade it ended up as financing colonial plantations it ended up financing fraudulent uh transactions which were not i mean there there was nothing been traded and yet you had a bill and you got money on it in today's world the shadow banking world much more complex uh you have a lot more kind of financial instruments you have and you now have i mean it's, it's uh what's called shadow money the repos you're using a security selling it uh on the promise of getting out of buying it back in two days and you're using the money to buy more securities you're not using it to finance production you're not using it to finance investment you're using it as working capital which you will use for speculation and making so that is the danger have i covered everything okay so um so on on france and the social experiments now now from my reading marx was really speckle was really skeptical of um um an agenda which began by let's say let's abolish money what 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 gray and bray were trying to do or have labor money chits or or those kind of things because he felt that i mean uh he argued that unless social relations change this is not going to Uh, going to have any uh, uh, i mean is 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 basically a utopian fantasy on the peel act he was he was really critical of the peel act because he felt that the peel act was 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 completely um um misguided and that came from his i mean 
because I mean, unlike the PLAC pr uh, propagators who had who belonged to the currency school and didn't understand money as a credit instrument, Marx was was closer to the banking school and and, and saw the problems uh, which the PLAC would create. And he also saw, and his and his and volume three, he is vituperative and he's really dismissive about these, you know, people like Lord Overstone or all these um, discount, I mean, the leading discounter, uh, the leading financiers and how they would kind of in, in these, in the, uh, after the, uh, in the evidence for the committees going into the, into financial distress, how they keep saying the Bank of England should be helping us, the Bank of England should make all bills convertible irrespective. And he was scathing because he says, you basically want the Bank of England to bail you out of everything and to, to finance your speculation and your... So, so there, there was that. Um, and I think I have covered everything, I hope. But we can, what I haven't covered, we can continue to talk about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Professor Vasudevan and Professor Hewitt.